Welcome to episode 306 of Game of Flavors podcast. My name is John and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators podcast. We like to talk about games. We've recently picked up games we're currently playing. And this week, we talk about non-video games in this week's episode of the Game Deflators. <laughs> I just went for Whoa. something different this week. <laughs> yeah, you went for something very different. Yeah, Jim, you've only been on the interview section. You haven't been part of a full-blown episode. Not not to witness the the... The, being the presence of of audio <laughs> talent like that no oh yeah and video mm. presence as well like it's, it's yeah good oh yeah seeing the process is totally different so yeah oh yeah cool. it's behind the scenes well not not really behind the scenes because you're here yeah um so we're joined by jim this week from crit hit con hi so everybody jim, thanks for coming on again we appreciate oh. it. i think this is number three or four four i think so yeah yeah i might be setting a record i don't know Oh no, Barry yeah. Perenza. <laughs> Barry. <laughs> yeah, Premium Edition Games has you beat right there. I think he's been on oh. like 10 times. Has he? Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah. we're going to we're gonna have to take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> represent the tabletops. There we go. So, Jim, if you uh, want to remind everybody listening and I guess watching now uh, who you are and where you're from and a little bit about Crit Hit and everything else you got going on. Sure. Absolutely. So, my name is Jim and um, I am one of the co owners and co founders of. Crit Hit AZ, which is a tabletop gaming convention. We uh, basically focus a lot on indie RPGs because that's where my heart lies. Uh, we do board games, mini games, uh, TCGs, all kinds of stuff. And I am also the director uh, of tabletop, one of the co-directors of tabletop gaming for Game on Expo, which is a big giant video game anime um, tabletop convention, uh, uh, both of which happen in Phoenix, Arizona. So. Uh, Game on Expo is in April and uh, Crit Hit is in July. Appreciate it. Do you have any uh, social channels you want to throw our way here? So sure. Find you? Oh, I have a whole bunch because uh, oh, there's sure. so much that I do. Um, so there's Crit Hit AZ, which is our uh, our website for Crit Hit Game on Expo, is obviously for Game on Expo. Um, and uh, also congen.com, which is a software that we develop to manage conventions and stuff like that, which is the majority of my time lately. So. Yeah, we might have to do a whole episode on just Conjun one day, just to yeah, learn more we're, about that. We're actually doing so after uh, Game on Expo, we went back and redid a lot of the back end stuff for it, um, and so we're making changes uh, to our first like major up um, version two. It's going to be two point zero one, I think, is what it is, and uh, it's Beguiled Beholder is the name of the the release. And that one is going to open it up to uh, non-game conventions, uh, so places like uh, you know, like a board game cafe or, or a bar um, or a uh, friendly local game shop or um, or groups as well. So if game deflators wanted to do their own like board game night someplace, they can use Congen to schedule it for people to sign up to play games with you guys, and okay. also for individuals. So we're open to all that. So. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on with it, and we've been just kind of tirelessly working on that lately. So I was actually working on that right before we got on. So, oh, cool, gotcha, yeah, nice. super cool. A lot of good things coming there. Uh, well, you can of course find the Game Deflators on thegamedeflators.com. Uh, I think we're up to date, Ryan. I don't know; it always changes week to week. Uh, you can also find us on social media <laughs> at Game Deflators on X at the Game Defla eh, at the Game Deflators on Instagram, Facebook, and Threads. So, yeah, I mix it up all the time, dude. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube. So if you're watching us, thank you. Go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, ring the little bell, all of that so you can stay up to date. And then you can find us on your favorite podcast application. So if you're listening, thank you for listening. Uh, go ahead and like, subscribe, comment, leave us a five-star review. Always appreciate it. All right, yeah. Ryan, what are we talking about today? You kind of gave us a little preview, but what's the, uh, what's the base of topics here? Yeah, so this week we'll be going over board games, tabletops, uh, just talking about learning new games, how that looks, a little bit about Mork Borg and the OSR, and uh, replayability of TTR TTRPGs. Uh, you know, do you want to run the same campaign over and over again as a GM? I don't know about over and over again, but we'll get into that. I don't know. We'll see. There's a we'll limit. We'll find it. <laughs> so before we kick off all of that, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into our recent pickups and what we're currently playing. I will start us off. I finally got Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier on PS2. So which one is nice. that? 
I don't remember. They had Jack and Dexter 1, 2, and 3, some stuff on PSP. And then I think this was on PSP and got ported to PS2, or it was on PS2, got ported to PSP. Interesting. Uh, but sealed copy, dude. It was 20 cool. bucks. Yeah, which is, you know, I could have bought. Uh, so kind of similar to the whole rule of rose situation happening out in Italy where they found like that random box of like 700 plus sealed copies of a $800 game at random. Mm -hmm. Still kind of a cool. Yeah, it's a cool story in general. Uh, there's a lot of controversy on that one. Uh, but yeah, some dude had like 200 copies that he had sold to Jack and Daxter. And that was the last one when I logged on. So I was like, OK, um, most used copies like New Condition were going for $34. So nice. 20 yeah. bucks new 20 bucks new sealed. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll take it. So that was the uh, big pickup for the week. And then I had some magic cards. So just kind of throw those there. Got a few magic cards that are tied to Bloomboro to mess with my red deck, some cool green stuff. So if I ever want to mess with squirrels again, I can do that. Um, and then I picked up a few others on a uh, TCG. They haven't arrived yet, but excited to have those come in so I can finally play blue black mill again. It has been like 10 years and I have my opportunity coming up. So I'm excited. Bring it back. I'm excited to piss people off at Friday Night Magic. Yeah. And then uh, as, what, as far as what I'm currently playing, uh, still playing Wo Long. I've got about five bosses left in Wo Long before I finish that up. Uh, currently have the playthrough sitting on YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing me actually crush bosses, I had, there's been, I think, a streak now of maybe six or seven bosses where I've just killed them off on the first try. Uh, of course, I've got two reinforcement characters with me uh through those levels and it's interesting because like i'll get to the final boss in these levels and kill the final boss no issue but getting to the final boss at times has been an absolute pain in the ass so i've had situations where i've had to repeatedly try and kill the same enemies uh most of it's because i'm being impatient uh the other part is it's actually kind of difficult to get through some of the levels uh but the bosses okay. have been eh, in terms of like comparison to games like sekido and uh, Neo and other titles. Uh, and then the other game I'm playing right now with my wife is Gollum. Uh, we are chapter, we're on chapter six of Gollum right now. And it's Gollum. It's every, <laughs> but I've been saying about it uh, over the Lots last. Lots of people uh, are watching it though. So that's good. People like it. Uh, yeah. Nobody else had... wants to play it. You're doing the work for the people, John. <laughs> I guess that's what's happening. Dude, there was, there was one area where I was trying to make a jump. And I just couldn't make the jump like it, it wouldn't work. And I was like, OK, I got to get this perfect. And then you finally do the jump. You make it through and we start progressing through the level. And at some point we tried to jump backwards and we died. Uh, and then it restarted us back at the beginning. I'm like, oh, my God, dude, this sounds like, like arc all over again. So bad. But the, the best part, this is this will tell you how janky the game is. OK, so most games, if something needs to happen, will say, oh, yeah, jump backwards jump forward whatever it may be that needs to happen so I'm, I'm running up this wall and it says press square to jump backwards and i'm like slamming square and it's not working like it will not jump backwards the input is telling me jump backwards it refuses to jump backwards so i had to do the old school way of okay we'll hit x and jump backwards well then now it's a timing issue and i'm trying to figure out how much mm -hmm. do i actually need to like press on x and hit the joystick back to be able to do my my backwards jump because the actual input doesn't work. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so Jim, I don't know how familiar you are with that particular video game, but it was no, I'm not. But it's considered one of the worst games of 2023. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like just in recent times. <laughs> oh yeah. Like it's it is uh, stories okay in terms of Lord of the Rings. It's a new story, so you know, uh, just this game specifically. It's not kind of taking. It's taking concepts from during the hobbit and then it's like an in-between like what happened to Gollum while he was in mordor basically and while he was cool. captured that's kind of the idea so brand except new that it's like the worst game <laughs> except yeah. it's the worst game ever the story like, nobody ever was like you know what i want to play as Gollum in jail i mean Probably. honestly i i would love to have played as Gollum in like the caves and maybe like during the hobbit and like maybe have it like from that period of when he got to the cave to the hobbit Right. Like, and then that's the end. The ring is gone. He freaks out. And then it cuts at that point. I'd be cool with that. But it's like after the ring is stolen, you're sitting in jail. And then afterwards, you get captured by elves, apparently. And then the game ends after that. So <laughs> it's it's weird. It's a unique story. I actually kind of enjoy story, uh, but the gameplay is a bit brutal. 
And I've told Ryan there's been scenes where I'm like the golem is like running in place <laughs> because there's like an invisible wall blocking him from moving forward. So you have to jump over this invisible barrier to do what you want to do. Oh, it's wow. janky. Yeah, it's janky. So, wow. And uh, are you playing that like on, on PC or PS5? PS5, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Jim, I'll pass it to you next. Do you have any recent pickups? Uh, yeah, a uh, little late to this one, but I picked up a game. I don't, I don't have, it's actually in the living room because I was reading it uh, last night, but um, I picked up a game called Fate of Cthulhu, uh, which is a, uh, a Fate core game. Well, it's actually a Fate, um, ex not accelerated, Fate, uh, it's one of the lighter versions of Fate, which I appreciate, um, but it is... It is a game that is sounds just kind of kind of batshit crazy. So I was like, yeah, I got to check it out. And then I listened to um, the creator on an interview because I was curious about this. And it sounded so weird that I had to pick it up. So Fate of Cthulhu is um, essentially Terminator, the RPG. Like, uh, so you pick out a um, one of like the elder gods at the beginning. <clears throat> and uh, whichever one that you pick out, that one has already taken over the world. People have gone nuts, uh, taken over, everything you know worked out perfectly in their favor. Humanity is being crushed. Well, a group of people figure out how to um, use a ritual with another dark god that allows people to travel in time, backwards and forwards, but forwards is really bad, and backwards... Um, you, I believe you can only go like 33 years and anything past that, uh, like your brain starts melting or whatever. And so you and a group of people go from the future where everything is already terrible uh, back to the bright, good old days of the year. And I kid you not, 2020. And, uh, <laughs> and so you're trying to prevent these sort of key moments in time from happening uh, to okay. prevent the apocalypse. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit term. It's very Terminator ish. It's, it's a, it's a, it sounds just bonkers. It doesn't take itself. I think that seriously. Um, and it's not supposed to be like this deep, uh, horror game more so than it is like an action game. So it, it sounds totally fun and I'm actually kind of itching to run it. So I'll have to look okay. at that. You said, what was it called again? It's called fate of fate Cthulhu. Of yeah. yeah. The, the coolest part that I think about it is it has something I haven't seen before not at this scale. So it gives you like four or five of these um, gods to take over. And each one is its own mini campaign. And just reading through it, it sounds like you can stretch it out if you really wanted to. But if you didn't, it, it seems like you can almost get through the whole campaign in like five sessions if you really wanted hmm. to. Interesting. Um, okay. So uh, that's kind of cool. Like, of course, you can stretch it out. But if you're just like hitting key point to key point where you're like, all right, six months later, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the next adventure. It sounds like you can do it in like four or five sessions. I'm going to put you on the okay. spot here. What are some other like short five, 10 session, like campaign, like titles similar to this that you've played in the past. You've really enjoyed. Um, so again, you can, you can stretch it out or you can do it this way, but um, we, we can do a whole episode yeah, on whole bunch. my favorite ep my favorite system. Uh, one of my, probably the top three favorite systems of all time is the mutant year zero engine. And those games basically have a meta plot that goes through it. And, um, each book in the mutant year series is kind of its own thing, but they all exist in the same world. So mutant year zero itself is about, <clears throat> you play, um, people that are mutated. So you have like mutant powers and you're living in the wastelands of a post-apocalyptic society. Um, and then they have other iterations of the game. So Gen Lab Alpha, Gen Lab Alpha, you're playing mutated animals um, that are in an enclosure trying to get out. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. Elysium, you basically play the few humans that did survive and they went underground and sort of their cyberpunk dystopia inside of like the silo that they live in. Um, and uh, Mechatron, I believe, is um, you're playing sentient robots in an underwater factory city that does nothing but produce robots and then you get sentience and you're trying to like escape mm -hmm. and so all these games each have their own little like mini campaign that you run through it and it's amazing but my favorite part of that is that all those campaigns timeline wise because they take place in the same world end at the same point so 
when you end all these campaigns, you can actually start another campaign that what happens when all of these societies meet in one oh. point in time. And then there's sort of like an Avengers type other bad guy that comes and okay. that's like a whole nother campaign you can play. It's nice. amazing. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna look that up. That sounds good too. That's one of my favorites. I love that game yeah. so much. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking in terms of like if you get a group of folks together and you're like, hey, let's play, you know, have board game night or campaign night, whatever it may be, instead of having to commit to two, three years of a D and D campaign and dealing with all of the scheduling oh, no. of things that happen. <laughs> this is a quick, hey, let's over the next few months, we're gonna meet up like once every couple weeks once every three weeks and we'll kind of bang through this yeah no um so uh, a lot of a lot of games out there don't do these really giant campaigns i mean you mm -hmm. they give you so like uh, savage worlds is, is amazing for this where they do what they call plot point campaigns mm -hmm. so you just get sort of like the key things that are supposed to happen in the campaign and if you play them through then it's you know maybe 10 12 sessions um but of course you know you do one plot thing and then maybe you do other little side things and then you can hit the next plot. So you can drag yeah. it out as much as you want, which is brilliant. Nice. Yeah, we've been talking about doing things like Gloomhaven as well, because that I think is a little shorter playing something like a Gloomhaven. But then you have yeah. the whole table set up and that can be it's a whole thing. thing. No, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know that box is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you uh, anything that you've played recently that you've enjoyed? No, I've just been cranking away on Conjun. Like that's been sort of our focus because we're doing a like a big uh yeah. A big refresh of that so that's that's been taking up all of my time nice ryan how about you what did you have this week so this week um a couple things it was my birthday so that was cool i got some cool birthday stuff i got some some one piece cards <laughs> all right nice. got some i got this cool book from a friend of ours uh, oh i oh. saw that at target today i wanted yeah. to buy that book yeah so I was uh, browsing through it earlier. It looks really nice. It's it's a good little book. So I'll check that out. Got a lot of the stuff I already put away. I got this. I, I haven't hung up yet, but I'm super excited about. What is that? It's uh, Bob's Burgers, but oh, in that like classic diner scene. <laughs> I've got yeah. another uh, smaller print of this, but it's instead of Bob's Burgers, it's like Stormtroopers and like Darth Vader and stuff in there. So I like that piece. And then, like many people this week, I am now fully uh, invested all of my time in Bellatro. Now that it's out on mobile, it is consuming me, and I'm trying to get it to consume as many other people as possible. <laughs> you know what you need to uh, consume? Bug fables. Yeah, I do. Well, hey, John, you know what? I've still got two months. <laughs> we do it. this uh, new games resolution every year where we have to play a game by the end of the year that is a game we've always wanted to play. And I usually finish sometime around Christmas. He's been punished twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, just just the once, right? What? No, it was twice. It was two yeah. years of Persona I didn't play. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So I'm going yeah. to do a, a five by five, I think, uh, in 2025. Um, so okay. in, board, in the board game world, there's something that sometimes I go like 10 by 10 or five by five. Um, I'm going to do a five by five because I, I can't do a 10 by 10. And what that is, is you pick uh, five uh, board games to play five times. Oh, okay. Throughout the year. Yeah. So the goal nice. is to get through. So uh, 10 by 10 is like the most common one, but there's no way I will do 10, you know, yeah. like 100 games. I will not. There's no way I don't have time for that. So I'm going to do like five by five of because I have so many board games that I don't play or that I want to. And like, I'm mm -hmm. going to do that. So now does there it have to be like, for example, and by the way, I thought it was CrossFit at first, but it sounds a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so can you take like one board game and say, all right, we're going to play five times tonight. Like if you decide, Hey, we're playing back to back to back. I guess you the, could. Like, I'm just kind of like, you know, there's some games are like, Hey, it's 60 minutes to play a game and you could end it in 30. And you're like, all right, let's play again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it just counts. The, the whole idea is that you're just playing the game. Playing it five times. Yeah, you're, you're pulling okay. that that shelf of shame. You're grabbing a, a, a game out of that, throwing it on the table so you can at least say that you played it. Because That's how this podcast was created. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. This, this was like your Steam list? And... Uh, no, I've got like 2,000 plus video games <laughs> oh my God. sitting on shelves. Yeah, so like your bookshelf is lots of games, board games and books and Mine is video games and wow. well D and D books and board games. Yeah, as well. he has a bunch of board games, but he he hasn't gotten me to to go over and start a podcast doing those. 
no, we're not going to. I mean, well, we kind of expanded a little bit. So we, we, theoretically, we theoretically could do an inflation deflation segment of a board game. If we want yeah. to. Yeah. Um, I actually, yeah. Um, I'll send you a I picture did... in a moment, Jim. No. Yeah. I did on. play a board game this week. I was over at a friend's house last night for birthday and we played the mind, which is like oh, a card cool. game. You've got a deck of cards from one to a hundred and you can't clue anybody in, but you have to somehow go around the table and put all of your cards in order. And you start off like level one, everybody only has one card and level two, everybody has two cards. We could not make it past level three. We tried and tried and it just, it wasn't happening. That is a great little party game. Yeah, you'll see it eventually. Gemma sent it to you on Messenger via oh, cool. a loft, and uh, that's only one side of it. So that's sure. um, it's quite a lot, actually. Oh, my goodness. Let's see here. Oh, you're going to look it up. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then i um, been playing a lot of Bellatro. Bellatro is really good. Uh, if anybody hasn't played it, it is a roguelike where you are playing poker hands, but you get all kinds of crazy jokers that modify the cards they give you like point multipliers for playing a certain suit or a certain certain hand or they give you more money in between rounds where you go to a shop and you can buy cards like tarot cards that will add special effects to cards or multiply cards or whatever so each round you start off with just a standard 52 card deck and by the end of it you might have you know 11 extra diamonds and uh, a bunch of extra sevens and sixes and it totally looks different but it all just builds in this engine you try to make to just generate points and mm. it's really fun it's really addicting uh everybody join me i <laughs> i know i'm just gonna have no choice but to watch him at least play a little bit tonight when he comes over oh yeah for, uh, oh D &D. yeah yeah so already know there is no downtime anymore there is only balatro so uh i'm looking at this picture holy shit that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That and what's awesome. crazy is there's people who have like two, three times of that in their house. I'm like, that's insane. Like I oh yeah. I I could not. Um, well, I probably could if I had space, well, so I'll but... tell you, I'll tell you a thing that that I'm like, oh, okay, hardcore, like you're hardcore. So I, I've I've known people that collect video games and stuff like that, and and they always have you know pretty decent stuff, and and sometimes they'll have um a little bit of the older stuff in there, and you, you and you kind of okay, you got like a Sega or you got a you know, a couple of versions of the, uh, that's the other wall of the Nintendo <laughs> or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I'm looking at the, I'm looking at Elson and I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's pretty fucking great. But then in the corner, mm -hmm. I Vectrix. can see the box for the fucking Vectrix. And oh yeah. my God. <laughs> <laughs> so back in, so before so I'm gonna here's my hipsters credentials before uh, doing retro games was cool. I was collecting retro video games Oh, uh, sick. because it wasn't a thing. Right. So mm -hmm. we're talking in like the, late 90s early 2000s mm -hmm. it wasn't really like a thing it was just there was places that you can sell stuff and there was some people that collected it but it wasn't it wasn't like huge the way it is now <clears throat> and everything was super affordable because nobody gave a shit about any of this old stuff right yep um but high on my list of like my my great white whale my moby dick was to get a vectrix and i can never find one at a time where i had enough money to afford it because that thing yeah. has always been expensive it has never been cheap that so, one's complete in box oh it's, oh. it's got the serial number all that good stuff but yeah. so i so a little background before we go into our full discussion i've mentioned this on the podcast if you, you haven't heard this i i worked at a game shop for a number of years and we had a vectrix chilling in the on a top shelf in the back closet and i was talking to my manager at the time before i took over managing I'm like hey what are we doing with this thing he's like oh we tried to get to work it doesn't work you can take it like, okay i'm like i'll take it it was rusted corroded on the inside but it still had some decent, like the chips weren't necessarily dead. It just, the board itself sucked. Right. So in terms yeah. of the screen, all of that, like it could power on, it didn't have any issues of powering on. You could see the screen, like a little dot in the center. So it was really, there were certain things that were dead. Right. So it could theoretically be utilized by somebody who could put in new chips, replace them and get it right. to work again. Too much for my taste. Uh, so I ended up finding one locally out in Phoenix. This guy had a Vectrix and a few games and the inserts and stuff, that box that you see. And I think at the time he wanted, it was like 400 for it is what he wanted. Great deal, right? That's a great deal. And I was like, well, I don't want to spend 400 bucks. But then I remember, I'm like, oh, I have a broken Vectrix here. What are they selling for on eBay? Broken. 200 bucks. 
yeah. on eBay broken. So I'm like, oh, well, hell yeah. So I sold it on eBay, shipped it out. I think I netted like 150, picked up the other one like that week, um, just to make sure I had it and ended up, you know, netting out $250 for a Victor. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And then fast forward several years and uh, I bought a multi-cart. There's a guy that sells multi-carts and third-party inserts and things that he creates. And so I have a multi-cart of like 60 Vectrix games on it. It is badass, dude. We've nice. played some stuff on that. Where we're like, wow, that's just... When you kind of consider what was being done at that period of time, like home arcade console that in that size and what it could do. Right. I yeah. mean, it's just super cool. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm... Nice eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, that's... that's. Oh, I love... Uh, that's yeah. the, That's the pride of the collection right there. Love I mean, it. at some point, I'm sure it'll die, but, you know, it's still pretty cool regardless. Hey. Yeah, play it till it dies. Yep. Uh, yeah, cool. All right. So uh, in terms of our topics this week, so uh, kicking things off, board games, TTRPGs, TCGs, learning curves. So if we kind of take this concept of riding a bike, right? If you've rode a bike before, you can hop on later on years down the road and you could probably still ride a bike. So when we think about things like Magic the Gathering, D&D, &D, uh, Pokemon, various RPGs, you kind of pick those up, you learn them for the most part. And then down the road, you decide, oh, I want to try this other RPG. What are your thoughts, the two of you, on how easy does it translate some of these games that you might have learned in the past to new games that you want to play down the road? Like, do you feel that having that base understanding of like one type of format, like DD 5e, for example, is enough to translate to? other campaigns is an understanding of magic the gathering enough to translate and quickly pick up and learn other card games so that's that's my start so ryan i'll, I'll throw it to you first so i mean it definitely is like learning any skill set or language or anything like that i usually think of things in terms of like uh, people who grew up playing video games a lot and can play a first person shooter Versus somebody who you just hand a controller to. And a lot of times they have a hard time being able to like move and aim and have that coordination that like as somebody who games all the time, it's just like ingrained into us knowing and being comfortable with the controls and generally knowing the layout of a controller, what buttons you expect to do, what actions and just having that memory. So I'm not great at board games and I do like Dungeons and Dragons, but I've watched like hundreds of extra hours of people breaking down rules and explaining things and just like talking about it as content online. So I kind of fast tracked not having to do as much of the doing portion of that. And I think that that's helpful, but a lot of times it's just about getting the repetition in and being able to not have to consult that handbook and that manual every time anything happens. Like that's the part about uh, getting into board games for me that can be hard. Cause it's like, all right, you got to read for 20 minutes or so. And then you kind of get going, you do a couple of practice rounds, but it's a lot of like, okay, double checking back and forth. And then you really start to have fun once you get through that phase. Yeah, to tack on before I throw it to you, Jim, I would agree with that on a board game standpoint. I think D&D &D and other campaigns, it kind of goes a little more natural. Same with card games. The board games, it's like every board game has, it seems like a different type of mechanic and a different way that rules are set and different types of usages for meeples and how cards and points and such work. Like everything is so different. People say, oh yeah, it's super easy to learn. It's like, okay, but there's hundreds of board games out there, all of them with differing mechanics, whereas... An RPG, it's, you know, there might be a different system, but like you're kind of beholden to that system. You're picking up, you're learning it, and you move through, and there's a story to tell, right? So it's a little more forgiving, in my opinion. Jim, thoughts? Um, I'm of two minds of it. So I think, I think, um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you like the Schrollinger's uh, answer to this, where if we're talking about like D and D, so D and D five E is basically a Rosetta Stone. Oh yeah, it is. It is sort mm -hmm. of a baseline that that we can talk about because um, that is uh, the lion's share of everything. That is that is what most people have played if they've played. Um, and I think that's good because um, there's there's concepts that you'll learn in D and D um, that tend to be true across uh, a bunch of different systems. 
Um, so you, you can sort of get it. Like every game is different, uh, you know, once you start kind of going into different uh, mechanics. But the fundamental, you know, idea of you have a sheet, those sheet ha has things that you can do. And that's what you use to sort of play this game. Like those fundamentals, I think, are are in some ways easier than board games because it's just a general concept of how a game is supposed to be played. Um, but then as somebody who lives in sort of like indie world and stuff that is not D&D, &D, um, sometimes uh, uh, there's a couple things that happen. Uh, one of them is that I think um, it can it can lead to this sort of spot where um, you almost have not, I don't want to say bad habits, but you have ingrained things that D and D does that other games don't. Um, and, and in my experience trying to run fifth edition, cause I'll, I'll sort of throw out my homebrew rules for it. And then, you know, it's usually followed by <clears throat> my, my spiel about how, uh, RPGs have always been homebrewed. Like that is that is from the very beginning, every game has been different. Um, so then I thought, so these are sort of my house rules. Sometimes those house rules go against such a deep ingraining of, of the D and D way of doing things that like I've had people walk away from tables, go, Nope, I'm not playing that. That's not D and D. And I'm like, well, it is, but you know, um, so, so it goes both ways. I think it goes both ways. I think there's, there's things that you can pick up that, that are universal. And I think also sometimes, um, they can hinder you as far as trying to understand how another game works. Yeah, I get your point. Like you, you definitely have that concept in mind of like, well, I've played D and D for five, 10 years, whatever it may be. I'm jumping into this new system. We'll say, um, you know, mutant near zero engine, for example, if that's mm -hmm. the direction we want to go. Mm -hmm. And you're right. There could be some general concepts that differ greatly from D and D. And it's like, well, I want to attack X enemy. Oh, well, this is how it works. And okay, coverage works a different way. And um, you can even, even in our homebrew stuff that, you know, for D&D, &D, Ryan, like we have rules at the table that sometimes come up like on the fly, it mm -hmm. seems like, oh, well, I want to hit that particular enemy. Okay, well, that enemy is behind a barrel and there's another person in front of them. So, all right, let's consider AC is now X, you know, because of that. So it, I, I get you. For sure, Jim. With all oh that. yeah, and um, so I've run into things where uh, some games are so fundamentally different that uh, perfect example I use first is there's a game called Dungeon World, which is um, based off of um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, based off of wow, I just totally drew a blank. Um, <laughs> based off of Dungeon World. Yeah, it's based off of Apocalypse World. I'm sorry. Um, I was thinking New Year's Zero. My brain didn't want to shift. Um, it was based off of Apocalypse World. And um, it's supposed to mimic D&D &D using the, this different system. I was running it for a friend who had played 3rd um, Edition, 4th Edition, and had played a little bit of 5th Edition because it was still pretty new. And at one point, she got so frustrated that she stopped and she looked at me and she's like, Jim, I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to do in this game. Cause this doesn't make sense to me. And the irony was, uh, the same game I would run for people who have never played a role playing game before. And they instantly grasped the concepts of what this game was doing. Um, versus it was so fundamentally different than D and D that she could not wrap her hand around how this is supposed to all work together versus somebody who has no preconceived notions that just vaguely know what a role-playing game is. It makes perfect sense. So cool. sometimes it can, it can work that way too. Yeah. And that makes sense too. Cause you, like you said, you have this idea of, okay, yeah, this is how it should work. And you're presented with how it's supposed to work. You're like, but no, it like in your mind, it's automatically, Oh no, I, I associate attacks. Like I said, with this is a concept and how it works. And you're like, no, it's not in this game. Yeah. It works yeah. different. Yeah. I feel like each of these categories has like major kind of like strengths and disadvantages when it comes to learning and how they kind of relate to each other. Like I, I don't feel like I've ever purchased a card game starter that adequately would have explained how every situation would work. Like you really just kind of have to play through it 
and be able to find the questions and the answers that come up during play. And you just kind of, okay, once you learn that's not how it's done, you kind of go in a different direction from there moving forward. But it was just like, you know, one hand of a card game. And then in a tabletop RPG, like there's almost always an answer in a book, but usually it's just kind of a starting place. Like there's a lot of room for interpretation between the rules where, you know, even if it's in there, it might not actually be all the way in there and you might never have like a satisfactory answer to everything. But I feel like for the most part, like, board games are pretty all encompassing and usually it's there's not much room for that ambiguity and there's not really a lot of having to chase outside resources to supplement where you're starting everybody starts at the same place and it, it even though games can be very asymmetrical in a board game you're all working from the same place no matter what you've gotten experience with before the rules are going to be there for you i think all of these you have to have somebody that understands it fully to start like you yeah. can't just it's so much more difficult to say hey guys let's have board game night let's pull a random board game off the shelf and like sit down and, and read through it because it's never going to work that way you, you have to have like a dedicated period of time and and honestly like i'll watch you need YouTube a gm <laughs> well you do that, you really do yeah, in a sense. Um, with board games, it could be a little different depending on the type of game and if a GM is required. I'll give the very basic example. We'll just say Settlers of Catan. Let's just say a group of people have never played it before, don't understand the concept. The easiest thing to do is one person is just dedicated to saying, hey, I'm going to watch YouTube videos on people talking about the rules and explaining and playing it. It's so much easier to go about it that way than going through and reading the manual. You're just not, you have to see the concept, at least in my opinion, you have to see the concept. And so the same thing can be applied to uh, trading cards specifically too. Like Ryan, you were saying, hey, let's play One Piece. And we just, I threw the deck, I shuffled it, but I had the general concept of magic gathering already. So the tapping of the thousand point stuff to be able to play certain cards and the attacks and things like that, I understood the very basic concepts. And the help I needed from you was, okay, my my turns, like if I'm attacking, mm -hmm. how does that work? How is damage dealt? Like, what are we doing here? Like walking me through that, that was good. And that gave me a firm understanding. If I played one piece today, I probably still wouldn't know. I'd have to get some more repetitions. Yeah. Place. But it was pretty quick to pick up, right? And the same thing could be said about D&D uh, &D or any TTRPG, I imagine, for the most part, if Jim was explaining it to me and said, here's exactly how it's happening, walking us through session one, session two, like really kind of hand-holding through the process, it would pick up pretty quickly from there. Board games, so much, I mean, it's vastly different, for sure. Right, yeah. So I think like board games, um, inherently, you know, they're a closed system. There's only so many things you can do in this, mm -hmm. in this, in this environment. And so, you know, documenting that is, is of utmost importance. It is the most important thing, right? So because role-playing games are situational and there are things that will just sort of come up that like, who knows, you can't account for every single thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, they lend themselves to that. And that has been the case since day one. So fun fact is that originally, um, they were not called DMs, Dungeon Masters. That came later. The original term, do you guys know the original term? GM? <laughs> no, no, no. No, really? no. Uh, judges, judges. Oh, judge. Oh, interesting. Okay, because I did not know that. the hobby comes from uh, a war game. And yeah. so when you have a war mm. game, there is a judge, much like you have a judge in a, in a TCG who knows the rules and makes a ruling. And so for the long time, and, you know, you know little, uh, little, spoilers of what we're going to talk about but um old school games um have an adage of rulings over rules so make a ruling versus trying to look for a rule um but that also you know that that's just one part of it i think another part of it that i know sorry about that um, <laughs> another part of it that comes up for people like me who are into everything but D, &D sometimes D and D is the biggest barrier to other games. And what I mean by that is that because people are used to like a session zero, you know, that is literally a whole session 
and hand holding somebody through one or two adventures or something like that to get them to really grasp all the things that they have to do um, makes people not want to play other games because um, and, and and here's where I'm gonna I'm gonna piss off some people right um, what I call like the biggest lie of fifth edition the biggest marketing thing that I really do not like about fifth edition is that somehow um the concept of fifth edition is the easiest edition of D, D ever made is like what most people believe especially people who've never played any of the other versions you know they'll say that fifth edition is the easiest version of D D that that exists which is not true you know the original you know box set you know basic edition i think the rule book is like 120 pages total with yeah, GMs. but it's got Thacko in it, doesn't it? No, 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 no. There's no Thacko. No, no, no Thacko. No. <laughs> it's no, not this, but, this is pre Thacko. Thacko. Okay, this uh, is pre Thacko. Okay, pre Thacko. Uh, second edition introduced Thacko, but even Thacko is really easy, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's this concept that, like, you know, the the fifth edition is the easiest one. It, it really is, and I actually always talk about how I think that's a it's a medium heavy game, somewhere in the medium to heavy crunch game. It is not the most complex game that's out there but it is far from the easiest. You know, I I have here, I'm gonna pull this. This is a complete uh, RPG. Uh, really? So I'm gonna focus, but this is a complete RPG. It's called Anarchy Goat. Uh, and you play a goat uh, that does anarchy. That's like the whole premise is you're just gonna go around, screw things up. I love it. I'm, I'm sold. Yeah, but this is a whole it's, game, right? It's complete. It's cool, wow. Um, most RPGs that are out on the market are actually, I would say, uh, if I had to do a big generalization, I would say probably like 70%, 60, 60 to 70% are much easier, much faster than fifth edition and much cheaper, right? You can buy, you know, uh, some of my favorite games don't cost very much at all. You know, I, I mentioned Fate of Cthulhu. Um, that entire rule book is like 30 bucks or something like that, 35 bucks. And that's everything that you need. You need one book and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, fake core often sells, you know, for 25 bucks. Um, you know, and we'll, that's we'll new it. price. Obviously you can get new used price. if you really wanted to. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and then, you know, some of the other ones like, um, uh, dungeon crawl classics, which is a, a good example of an OSR game. Um, they have the hard book book, the hardback book, which sells for, I think like 40, 50 bucks, right? Normal price. But they also put on a paperback version of it. It's the same thing, only it's paperback. And that's like 25 bucks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, between being cheaper and easier and faster and easier to learn, sometimes D and D is a problem because I think people think, well, I invested so much time in learning D and D that I don't want to learn something else because they assume it's going to take just as much effort when in, that's far from the truth often. Well, and, and a thing that other people don't really factor in as well is that you could theoretically take the stories and such that are happening in D&D &D and utilize other mechanics and use mm -hmm. the, the story as a base point. You could theoretically do it of any campaign if you wanted to, say, throw in fifth edition rules into some other sort of story. Like if you wanted to do, I don't know, say Transformers, uh, that whole campaign that's tied up. If you said, hey, we I want to take the story in this concept and let's just make it 50 or 5e e compatible, right? Like I, I'm, I know it's a little well, different, sometimes but sometimes that's it's, it goes into the, the problem world, is it goes into the world of homebrew is what I'm saying. Like you well, can theoretically it, homebrew those concepts. It does. But like 5e e is built to support like that type of fantasy. And a lot of times exactly. people are going to really be led astray by thinking, well, what if I just shoehorn being Wolverine into 5e? Well, you're never really going to live that Wolverine experience. You're going to, have something hobble together that you're not really going to be happy with when there's there's a wolverine game out there you could play a I'm, superhero game if you want to play a superhero game they make it i'm just saying theoretically theoretically you can transfer stories and do homebrew type stories like they have D, &D stories that are based on like you know homebrew settings that have been created yeah. for certain worlds right so you could theoretically do stuff like that well, you, you could and so uh so i <laughs> I know it's opening we're, up. We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hit all all my trigger points. There. <laughs> um, D and D does D and D very well. Yes. Um, 
I wouldn't even say as so far as that it does fantasy very well. I think it does a decent job of fantasy. It's a good game. Fifth edition is a good game. Um, but it does D&D specifically very well. You want to play D&D, nothing else does D&D except for D&D. <laughs> if you want to play a fantasy game, like I can probably list off 10 off the top of my head that I would play before D&D. Mm -hmm. um, each of them doing something a little bit different and 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 some in some cases doing something's better, right? But the thing that, that kills me is like on, you know, you scroll through Facebook or social media and you see ads for, um, you know, uh, an anime version of fifth edition or a sci-fi version of fifth edition. Or um, my favorite was, uh, I thought somebody did like a um, sense and sensibility or something like that. That was like supposed to be fifth edition. <laughs> There's no rules for that stuff in there. And, and so the yeah. adage is always, well, if you're a good GM, you can adapt to anything and you don't, you just, you know, just do homebrew rules. Yeah. But that's not what the game is built off of. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it does, there's no mechanics for that. Like, uh, I pissed off a lot of people one time in the, in the crit hit group. Cause I was like, um, fifth edition doesn't do horror. It cannot do horror. In my opinion, it is not, there's, there's no horror mechanics in fifth edition. You know, yeah. And somebody was like, "Well, it can do anything if the GM is good enough." I was like, "Yeah, you're creating your own rules, therefore you're creating a new game. Basically, just because you're tacking it on doesn't mean that that system is made for it because it inherently doesn't have it, which means it's never going to quite get that feeling right." I said, "Show me the rules." You're like, "Well, it's not because I said um, I took a, a so the game designer, not the not the assassin, John Wick, uh, is uh, is a friend of mine and and a bad influence on me." Because uh, I always say that John Wick has ruined more role-playing games for me than than I can think of anybody else who has. But John Wick had described D&D often as uh, it's a game about killing people who don't look like you and <laughs> ruffling through their pockets for some change. Like that's the essence what D&D is about. And people mm -hmm. get all kinds of men out of shape. But fundamentally, it's true. Most of the, most of the rules in D&D are centered around combat and how do you optimize combat. Yeah, one-third um, of the books is things to fight right you and know, so that's... where's the social engagement where is you know there's some rules in there for that but that's not really what it's made to do so homebrewing backwards in always causes a problem because the the rule system does not fit you know the the flavor of it uh i'll give you for example there's a i have um blade runner the game and on the surface, you're like, okay, it's just a cyberpunk game. But if you start reading the rules and, and see what the thesis of that game is about, it's about humanity. Um, because you're not, you know, one of the things in the game is uh, you might not know if you're a replicant, if you're a robot, you might not be aware that you're one yet. Or maybe everyone else knows and you don't. Or you do know that you're a robot and you're trying to be as human as possible. And so you're coming across all these cases and all these you know, crimes that you're investigating while still trying to retain your humanity and your connection to being a human being. And that's the thesis of the game. And there's rules in there that really supplement that really hardcore that I don't think fifth edition could ever touch. And so it's always about the right tool for the right job. Yeah, makes sense. And, you know, it's funny, you, you kind of triggered me here on a purchase I made recently. It was, um, it's called Owojima, I think it is. And it's a fifth edition campaign that's being developed, but it crosses Studio Ghibli anime with like this island and that's the overall setting mm -hmm. so i bought it because i like studio ghibli right i like that art and the book looks beautiful the art is fantastic i'm curious because it's a kickstarter I'm genuinely curious how the heck they're going to manage everything that they're doing on like the setting and kind of mapping it up with dnd so there's new creatures of course things of that nature that are specific to that island uh so we'll see um but yeah, you just reminded me that I'm I'm waiting for that book to come in. So, what if there was already a game that did that? What if somebody already solved all the problems was trying to play Studio Ghibli um, as a role playing game? Then I would buy it. <laughs> and yeah. I would try to learn it, right? So, yeah. But it, uh, it's one of those things you kind of see it, and you're like, oh, that's really cool art. Like forty bucks, whatever it is, I'll back it. You know, I'll back a creator and move forward with that. So, yeah, and those things are always cool. Like I don't I don't blame anybody from doing it um, because. At the end of the day, you know, when you're putting out a book, it's it's a business decision. You know, that's one of the games I was looking for. Golden Sky Stories, yeah. Golden yeah. Sky. So I just put a link for Golden Sky Stories, which is Studio Ghibli, yeah. basically. Um, there's another game called Wander Home, 
that's kind of in the same. Isn't that thing. the animal one specifically mm -hmm. wander home? Yeah. Yeah. I think that Ryan, didn't we talk with somebody a while back that was on the podcast and that was, um, sounds familiar. Yeah. I'm going to look at the cover here and I'll tell you, um, I already see possum. Yeah. I think this is it. Yeah. That looks, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I, well, thanks for the reminder because I've been wanting to buy this one. I couldn't remember. And I'm like, I don't want to go back and listen to all my podcast episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, I always tell people like. Um, and I hear that's a very easy game to learn too. Yeah. yeah, most of them are like most most of the games that I'm talking about are really easy to learn. Yeah. Um, and that's where we go back into like sometimes D&D can hinder you from learning other games because, you know, if it takes me this long to play in a D and D set. I don't want to go through that for another system, not understanding that something like golden guys, golden sky stories, you can learn the rules in five minutes. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you'll cheap. note, and it's cheap. Yeah. Um, I like to tell people like, instead of homebrewing things, uh, just do some Google searches. Cause sometimes the thing you're looking for, if it doesn't outright already exist, um, you know, like Marvel superheroes or something like that. Right. Um, there's stuff that does it that mimics that right without the license, you know? Um, so like you have the, uh, the Marvel, the new Marvel superhero game that just came out. That's a good one. Um, one that flew under the radar is, um, what's it called? Uh, Sentinel comics, which is based off of, um, the card game. Um, I forgot the name of the card game, but, but there's a card game that's like a superhero card game and it's based off of that. So Sentinel comics is, is probably one of the best superhero games that I have ever seen. And nobody talks about it because it came out had the unfortunate problem of coming out when COVID first kicked off, like mm, yep. somewhere early 2020 where nobody was really paying attention. And this game came out and it's fucking amazing, but nobody plays it. It's usually how it works, right? Yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, dive into our next topic. I think it's a good segue into Mork Bork. Uh, so you were telling me about this last night and talked about it uh just before the podcast started so you know give us a little insight into this game so this is uh, there we go yeah let's uh, okay. see if we can get that in there without uh, blurring so morkborg is described as a doom metal album of a game a spaked flail to the face rules light and heavy on everything else uh this game came out uh, a couple of years ago again in 2020s when it was released it funded and kickstarted i think 2018 or 2019 something like that and it really changed the game uh in the rpg industry if nothing else because this book is is an art book uh, above everything it's so else sick. the website looks amazing yeah the if you start looking at like the pages it just gets pretty nuts like the design the graphic design of this thing mm -hmm. is is pretty yeah it's not working so well but the graphic design of the game is is really different it's it's very what i call art punk um so it's different fonts it's different colors there's neon pinks and reds and blacks and yellows and it's just it, it's, it's like it's 80s it's what it kind of comes down to right it <laughs> looks yeah it looks like what it says it looks like a like a doom metal album yeah and um it came out and, and it came out so it's, it's very dark it's very grim um but almost to the point of absurdity like uh it's it straddles it straddles a line it li it's closer to dungeon call classics and just like uh how gritty it is, but it's almost, it's not quite as funny as dungeon crawl classics can be, but it's definitely in that same vein. And, um, it, it sort of took off one because it visually it, it, it's there two because it is, uh, such a stripped down OSR game. Um, and there's tons of OSR games out there, but this one was a little bit different and, um, it's so stripped down and it works so well. And it's so fun and quick and deadly that um, people just really fell in love with it. And the thing I think that was key for them is the guys who made it, which is a, a group called the Stockholm Cartel, um, which is a bunch of Swedish designers. Uh, and consequently, a lot of them work for Free League, which is who published it, which is who makes Mutant Year Zero and a bunch of the games that I love. Um, that also probably explains the <clears throat> Doom and Death Metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, that's like, just to go into that, you know, yeah, that's, that's a stereotype, but it makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is like hardcore in their culture over there, I think. Yeah, for um, sure. Uh, one of the things that, that I think really set this game apart was that they 
didn't go the usual route of using the the WOTC open gaming license, the OB, OGL. They did their own thing where they just were like, you can use our stuff, just don't be racist or homophobic or you know, just don't put anybody else down while you're using it. And you can use our stuff and put out your own game um, forever, basically. And so people did. Um, Morkborg in and of itself is not a very big book. I think it's like a hundred and it's maybe a hundred ten pages or something like that. It's and another very... another affordable one as well. I think that's a thirty five dollar book for mm -hmm. that one, and yeah. that's not on sale. If you did happen to find it on sale somewhere, it'd be yeah, cheaper. yeah. It's under it's under a hundred pages. It's got everything you need in it, <clears throat> but because they put out this open gaming light or this open license for it, um, the fan community just started making so much stuff for it. Like it's ridiculous the amount of fan made content that is out there to build on your game or modify it. And that of course led to people making hacks of the game where they take the sort of these cool core rules and adapt it to other things that fit those rules, right? Whereas like I was just talking about how like D and D can't do everything. Part of the reason that D&D can't do everything is because there's so many rules tacked onto it that if you start shifting any one of those rules one way or another, the whole thing can topple very easily. This is where the, uh, here's, you know, I'm just going to continuously piss off people that listen to this thing. Um, this well, is the where definition the of OSR, bring it up more, right? Yeah, I'll get to OSR. Um, this is where the illusion of game balance. I think I hate the word game balance in RPGs. Like I think it's the most bullshit thing ever. I hate it. It is, it is a waste of time it is an illusion of game balance um that if you start toppling all those rules you start messing with all those rules of fifth edition you can break it very easily um when you strip it all down when it's just only a couple of core components now you can be way more flexible and uh, Morkborg does that and it actually gives you sort of a template on how to do that for other settings inadvertently if you just copy the formula and just change the flavor of it you find out that that really 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 works and so that led to a bunch of hacks of Morkborg. So uh, some of the hacks out there are like Cyborg, which is a, um, a cyberpunk version of Morkborg, right? Um, and the funny thing is everybody calls it Borg. Uh, Mork, it's, it's actually, I say Morkborg, but it's, it's pronounced like Mirk Bjorg or something like that. And it means dark tower. But... Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, everyone just sort of uses Borg at the end of something, right? So um, Cyborg is uh, a cyberpunk game. Clever. Uh, um, there is other games out there like um, uh, there's Cyborg. Stockholm Cartel, the people who actually make more Borg, made a sci-fi version um, called Death in Space, uh, which is really cool. It's very. It reminds me of The Expanse a lot. So it feels very much like the expanse. Um, but then there's like other there's pirate there's, borg, I think, right? There's pirate borg, which is hands down probably one of the most the best versions of Mork Borg that you can play. Um, we actually had the the creator out at um, Game on Expo last year. And the dude is awesome. He is just fucking awesome. Yeah, I've got his contact info here on my desk somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I still need to reach yeah, yeah. out to him. Reach out to him. I'll put you in touch with him on, on uh, Discord. Sounds um, good. But his version is probably one of the best versions of Morkborg that I've seen out there. It's just a beautiful book. It's really well put together and it's pirates and it's so cool. Um, there's a one called Vast Grim, which is another space one, but that one is very much like if Morkborg happened in space, that's, that's what that feels like versus death in space, which feels like uh, a little more grounded. And then you have all kinds of weird ones, right? So you have stuff like um, Orc Borg, <laughs> ORC Borg, right? And so Orc Borg is you're playing orcs and it's just sort of like from the orc point of view, right? Which is kind of funny. Um, you have uh, other stuff like, um, uh, what's this other one here that I had? Oh, um, they should Demon... make us go ahead. Go, go ahead. Uh, they should make a Star Trek one. Borg Borg. <laughs> Borg Borg. <laughs> Somebody should do that. I'm surprised that's not already being made. If not, uh, we're, like... we're going to patent it right here. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get together after and we'll do that one. Cause uh, we'll make money. Um, <laughs> So one of the one of my favorites I've seen out there that I need to buy is called Corp Borg. Oh, uh, oh nice. no. Is that what Corp, I middle, middle management? Corp, Corp Borg is a rules light office crawl OSR tabletop RPG. 
Um, you have like classes like the salesman, the engineer, the designer. Uh, there's evil conglomerates to bring down. There's office tools to fight with, like a paper cutter blade, keyboards, and coffee mugs. Oh my god! Hordes of enemies, including mindless colleagues, bloodthirsty managers, and eldritch demons. Um, uh, there's tables for like 66 urgent emails that you have to send out. Like, it sounds amazing. So I, oh I have god. to buy this. I um, living in corporate America and, and working, I don't. I don't know how I feel about going into an RPG table and be like, all right, let's do this. Yeah, uh, I do too. And I think it'd be great because like, I can finally be like, all right, here's how this is going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> you like if, into the office with the staple gun. <laughs> well, if they put me in a meeting, I'm just going to like just destroy the office because and just start screaming. This could have been an email. And, uh... <laughs> oh man, uh, you gotta so... love it. Um, so in terms of stripped down rules and let's just say as a GM, like how easy would it be for somebody like me who is, has, doesn't own a book? Let's just say I picked it up off the shelf and mm -hmm. said, I'm going to buy it today. How quick is it to learn this overall book? And then as far as a campaign is concerned, um, or is, you know, factored in here, are there books that are specifically like this is a setting or is it step-by-step? -step this is a story. Like, how does that all work out? And I know I'm throwing D and D into that. No, no, absolutely. No, in, that, in that mindset, but so the back page, when you open up the book and it's all blurred out stuff right now, so I apologize for that, but the back page of that, that is 90% of the rules. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, the rules are super simple. It's a D 20 system. Mm -hmm. Um, this one's different and then you're rolling under. So you have four, uh, abilities with the call, but it's like attributes. So you have uh, agility, presence, strength, and toughness. And basically those can cover just about everything that you do. And you just roll under that stat and you succeed or fail um, based off of uh, a target number. Generally the target number um, is going to be 12. And so you have a little bit of modifiers that you put in there. Maybe you have a plus one or a plus two, maybe you have a minus one, minus two, but it doesn't ever go much beyond that. And um, as a GM, it's a, it might be different for you because the GM doesn't actually roll. And the GM get to play. <laughs> yeah, the GM plays. So okay. you'd be surprised at at, um, at games where the GM, where you have what's called player facing roles, where the sort of mm -hmm. the players dictate everything, right? So if I say that a a monster is attacking you, and I'm the GM and you're the player, you're rolling to evade my attack. And if you yeah. fail it, then you're going to get hit. And then, you know, I'll roll the dice maybe for, mm. for damage if I want to, or you can roll the dice for damage. It doesn't really matter. But taking the load off of physically rolling dice um, in some games works really well because it allows me as a GM to focus on all the moving pieces of the story and what's happening in the environment and how to sort of, you know, just think about those things because I'm not stopping to roll a die and resolve. Um, I let the players sort of do that. And so that's, that's one of the things that is different about Mork Morgan that works like really that. super well. Yeah. So does that specific book that you have, does that one have a story built in or is that purely rules and introduction and things of that nature? And then you might have to pick up a different book that, so for example, Pirate Borg, I imagine has like a few nuances that are different from Mork Borg. Would Pirate Borg have its own standalone story that the players and the GM are working off of? Or so, is it all homebrew style? <clears throat> so that's another cool thing about about uh, Mork board games generally and, and their hacks. Um, there is a world, a campaign world usually in them. But one of the things that Mork board did um, that is very popular in a lot of OSR things and a couple of other modern, especially modern uh, design games is that there isn't, you know, 30 pages of lore. Yeah. There isn't a detailed town that's that's done for you right so there's a setting there's a theme to the game so in morkborg um the world is dying everyone knows that the world is dying and you're basically just trying to eke out your existence in this miserable world as best as you can like you're not a hero you're just, you're plunging for money you're just trying to get money to survive the next day you're you're the scum of the world right um one of the mechanics in the game is every day in the game you roll a die <clears throat> when you start the game, you decide um, the question that's in the book is how long will this, uh, when will this agony end? <clears throat> and so what you're picking is how long does the world have left to live? Oh, wow. And so uh, it can be uh, years, months, um, 
days, I imagine. Day, yeah, yeah. Hours. And, and, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's like right around the corner. And based off of that, you roll the die when you first start playing the game as a campaign. So let's say mm -hmm. we do um, a cruel month. So um, you roll a D6 because it's a month. And if it comes up a six, then um, basically there's um, a page in the book that looks like um, like a Bible almost. It's laid out like a Bible. Mm -hmm. And there are like these prophecies that come true. So every time you roll like a six on this die, um, one of the prophecies comes true. So one of the sort of uh, things happens and that changes the game and it gets worse and worse and worse. So you get to the seventh one, which is, um, and they're called Psalms. So these are all like the Psalms. So the seventh <laughs> Psalm. Oh, it is a Bible. Yeah. Is uh, seven Psalms, seven, seven, all praise uh, yet to neck, the underworld's nightmare, the black disc, which stands before the sun, all praise be who becoming, uh, beaming with delights, all praise the fire, which burns all in the darkness that swallows the darkness. And that's the end of the game. Oh, no matter wow. what you're doing. If once you go past so many of these things, times that you roll six in this month after all these sort of prophecies come to pass the last one is that's the end the world's over everyone dies um the book so that's built into it. Park. all right <laughs> yeah um but the other thing that it does is because um it's a rules like game and it has a lot of modern things it will do things like give you a very short paragraph of flavor text that is um it's very um evocative so i'm gonna give you a quick example right so uh the land is made up of different you know like any other kingdom it's a fantasy thing um it, it's kind of looks almost like england right um there is uh Galdenbreck. the land of tilveld is the greatest city that is ever known no king or queen rules in Gal Galdenbreck. uh but an arch priestess josiah Mygal deep beneath the cathedral of the two-headed basilisk in a cool black chamber crossed by shards of light lies their throne. And so it kind of goes on like a couple more sentences of that, but it gives you just a couple of details yeah. of who rules it and what it's like. And then as a GM, you can sort of expand on those things. And that's to um, visualize it as well, obviously. That's what yeah. it's, that's what it's for. And it's yeah. sort of inspires you to, to do something with that. So uh, that's, that's, basically how Mark work works. And um, the campaign is sort of built into it because you're sort of playing till the end of the world. You can explore, you know, you, you basically can hex crawl it if you want to, you can go on very specific adventures because people, there's tons of them out there mm -hmm. and uh, it's just so much fun. Nice. I'll have to look into it a little bit more. Um, I definitely like the stripped down rules. That for sure is very appealing, uh, especially when picking up a game pretty quick uh, in terms of storytelling. It'll be interesting to see, different hacks and things that are out there and see different books. Um, you know? Yeah. So the reason, those, the reason yeah. I brought it up uh, was because, uh, you know, uh, I'm big in the indie world. This is the, this is sort of where I live and love things. <clears throat> um, there, is, there was a local artist who was, uh, is just an amazing artist named Matt Malinsky. And uh, I've had Matt out at crit hit. And as a matter of fact, I was one of the people that like, challenged him because he was one of these like D and D is everything guys. And I'm like, well, is it really? And we'd have these like deep dive discussions on, on, on D and D sometimes a little bit heated. Um, we sort of lost track of each other during COVID and then we rediscovered each other post COVID when we were kind of going through the convention stuff. Um, he sort of came around, he started digging into like some of these other games that were out there and he fell in love with Morkboard Cause that's very much sort of like his aesthetic. And so he is a local guy here in Phoenix that uh, kickstarted last month. I think we got a couple days left on it, depending on when this goes up. Um, a game called Chainsaw, which is basically a horror movie that uses the Morkborg rules. The dude's made, it's up to like $50,000 on Kickstarter so far. It's doing really well. And um, it's so cool that this particular rule set lends itself to horror stuff really easily. And uh, that there's a local designer that, you know, switched gears from fifth edition and went all in on doing this sort of crazy eighties horror movie role-playing game. And I think that's super cool. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. We'll have a, I assume you can send me a link uh, to that and we can throw that into the description of the episode sure. so we can yeah. at least link out to that. Uh, even if it's not, you know, 
evergreen content. Well, at least hopefully in the first get couple the days here, get some folks in. Nice. So um, beyond, well, I don't know if you want to say OSR or not. If you want to trigger some people, we don't have to. We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning OSR, OSR just stands for uh, either either old school renaissance or old school role playing games, and it basically what it's talking about is uh, older versions of of games. So like you know, first second edition versions of D and D or other games that that sort of the rules have gone past. That's that's basically what that means. That's and if you're with us still, comment. Which is your <laughs> preference? Let's <laughs> start an argument online. Oh, we'll absolutely. Where it goes. All right. So the next thing is replayability of TTRPGs. So as a GM, you're running a certain story. We'll we'll say D and D for just sake of D and D. But we can mm -hmm. say even like smaller things like uh, Wander Home would be a good option here, given that it's a smaller um, or a different RPG. Uh, what are your thoughts as GM on running the same story multiple times? My thought jumping into is that it differs it differs on the table differs on the players and the actions that they take and what they want to do so you could theoretically have a story and i'll bring up ryan for example you did um the underdark story for D, &D years back i've considered rerunning that uh from the start main reason being is that the actions that are taken at the very beginning of the game that are going to dictate certain things from happening down the road are probably 99 percent of the time going to be different with a new table versus the existing table that we had. Uh, so that's kind of how I would look at it. I'm, I would be okay running. I would say in terms, if I had a numerical value on it, I would say maybe two max three times running the same story, knowing it's going to be different each time, uh, with a different set of players. I don't think I would ever include the same players at that table though. Jim, you, you do a lot of GMing, right? So yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I actually, um, so, uh, a, a kind of common trope that's, that, uh, people say about like being a, a, a GM or a DM is that you're basically almost like a writer, right? Like you're a writer telling a story with your friends. Um, I've never, I used to click with that, but then there was a certain point where I got into all these indie games that it dawned on me that I'm not a writer, uh, telling a story with my friends doing the other characters. Uh, that's not at all what I like to do. Um, I'm a movie director that takes a script and does my version of it. You know, you can take, you can take a movie script and hand it to, you know, two, three, four different uh, directors. And you can watch that movie probably from each director and get something out of it because they're all going to key in on sort of like different parts of it. And, and they're going to do their different versions of it. Now, with that being said, if that's true, that I'm the director, then that makes the players essentially the actors in it, right? And so these actors have agency and they have their characters and it's gonna be different every single time. Um, and so I love running the same adventure over and over again. Um, one, because with repetition comes familiarity and then I can that allows me to dig deeper into the stories or, or maybe a previous game something will happen that I hadn't thought about. So now I incorporate that into the new game that I'm running with somebody else. Um, so I think it's a, it's, you know, I don't know if I would do like a D and D style campaign where it's, you know, oh, yeah, way uh, too like long. a year. Yeah. It's way too long, but something shorter for sure. Um, Call of Cthulhu comes to mind, right? So Call of Cthulhu <clears throat> works really well as one shots or two shots, three shots, right? You, there are campaigns in Call of Cthulhu and they're pretty long. But uh, for the most part, you can do like a mini campaign, four or five games, and that's sort of like a thing. Um, I love running those over and over again because the more I run them, the more I know them. So the more natural I am with um, describing the scenes and, and yeah. sort of taking into account all kinds of stuff. So it just, it becomes, excuse me, becomes a, a more uh, complete world at that point. And, and I love that. I think that that actually makes me better at running those. That makes sense. Ryan, how about you? So I've never really run anything multiple times outside of like the Fandelver box for starting 5e. And that's just a pretty quick thing. I mean, I've done my own kind of world building and, you know, have my own notes and ideas on campaigns that I've run or would like to run and 
everything that kind of incorporates around that. So I think I kind of like the idea more so like if I was going to want to run another group through something that I had already made before, I mean, it probably wouldn't be exactly the same. Like I've got this, uh, <laughs> this agency that I made that's kind of like, uh think like x files but in a dnd setting like they're out there you know trying to look into like these weird situations going on so it's like you know you're going to be different characters you could be from the same agency and you could be doing similar things but you know in my mind and for my purposes like i've looked at that story and you know maybe maybe you take a look at like um if the campaign didn't finish, I mean, what happened to those heroes? Like, how did the villains like actual, you know, resolve that? Like, depending on how married to your world and how you want it to develop is, you know, every campaign, whether it ends good, bad, or just falls off, you know, and nobody plays it anymore, you could bring all of that still to your next campaign that you're going to run and be like, well, now it's 100 years later and the bad guy won. Like, let's see what you guys are going to do about that. So... You know, you're kind of playing with yourself, even if you are playing with other other players. And I just I would like to try to keep that moving forward for me more so, I think. I've, I've done that. I love doing that. So I've done that. Um, the first time I did that was I uh, when I was in the army, I ran a year long campaign of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we sort of incorporated some of the turtles orb on top of stuff that I did that sort of filled out some of the gaps in Ninja Turtles. And uh, we played that for about a year. It was a great campaign. Um, terrible system, but great campaign. Um, and then I would run it a couple times for other people in other states. And what I was doing is I was taking sort of the events of my one campaign and making the game with these strangers who had no idea about any of this stuff be after that so they lived mm -hmm. in a post campaign world that had already changed and then whatever they did incorporate into the, like the next group um up until like i think at one point i sort of r literally ran like this giant almost end of the world scenario kind of thing but uh in my head there was a head cannon like i could tell you the history of that whole yeah. game you know before and after whatever players came and i i love that i think that's cool that's like the best part of being a gm i think i've done kind of a similar thing to that in a sense like so our group is a lot of the same players like most of us have played with in various campaigns together or in separate but we've had like at some point you have a crossover like one person played this campaign of one person this person played with another person this campaign another person so now you have this table of six players with a gm that everybody's kind of got a basic idea of what's happening so i've actually taken characters from other campaigns as long as it's kind of been in the same general world and pulled them into that mm -hmm. so i did uh avernus and ryan you weren't involved in that campaign but i I had the characters going out to hell and I had one of my old players that the entire table hated. Uh, th this guy <laughs> was an absolute dick in a campaign, killed multiple people, like destroyed an entire city, just crazy stuff. And I actually pulled him and he was one of the um, like, you know, militia guys for one of the devils in Avernus essentially. And he was, you know, kind of making things happen. I had the group come together and they fought that character. Right. And so they had a good time with that. Uh, so Ryan, if you recall, that was Ornstein. Yeah. Uh, and that, yeah. So, and there's <laughs> that, so that, you know, that is, that is yeah, like it, such a great GM tip in general. Um, that that's true for any game, right. Is take the characters that other people worked on and just steal them. Right. Yeah. Just they're already fleshed up. out. Yeah. You yeah. already know them. You already know their mannerisms, you know, their weird ticks, And usually it's stuff that you would never think of. Right. Oh yeah. Cause it's, it's outside of yourself. And so I love those kinds of things because somebody will like you're doing the work for me and you're doing it in a way that I couldn't do it. Like I can't think of characters a certain way because it's not me. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love those kinds of characters. And even like some of like I've pulled from, I've done crossover stuff. So one of our buddies that we, he has a homebrew, he's been running with us for probably about three years now. We've taken a pause and gone to other campaigns in between. So that's why it's taking so long, but he had this merchant that was like a little known blind merchant. And I forget the name, but he would, he, like try to rip people off like he would sell people um flasks of or, uh yeah flasks of hydration and <laughs> charge them 50 gold but it was or 50 copper it was really just a bottle of water 
So um, elixirs of hydration, I think is what he called it. Uh, so, you know, things like that. And so that person was in Neverwinter. Well, I had his long lost sister who hated his guts was living in Baldur's Gate. And so the table is in Baldur's Gate for my campaign. Meanwhile, his campaign's taking place in Neverwinter. And then we have this, uh, I think her name was Ophelia Swift Hollow. And then he had something Swift Hollow. So when I said the name, he just looks at me and goes, what are you trying to do here? And then she's over here selling like elixirs of hydration as well. Uh, so it's just like that family crossover. Oh, awesome. it's, it's fun, quirky things that like the players enjoy, right? I think that's at the end of the day, that's what you're looking for, right? Absolutely. Enjoyment and fun at the table. And so when you can pull little elements like that in, even if it's not... 100% within the rules or canon, you can still have some fun with it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So cool. Well, um, I think, you know, maybe a part two down the road will be in order. Talk more uh, tabletop and stuff. We can look at some other avenues on discussions, but it's been good chatting with you today. Definitely absolutely. appreciate having you on. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for having me on, guys. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we've been joined by, it says Crit Hit Jim, and we'll say Jim of Crit Hit. Arizona credit con. So go check it out and all the social media tags and such that we provided earlier, uh, as well as game on expo, which are coming up in, I think you said April, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then crit hit is in July next year. Yes. Yep. Yep. So 2025, those will be some good shows, but this has been episode three Oh six of the game of players podcast. My name's John. I'm Ryan. And I'm thanks Jim. for listening. <laughs> it's Jim. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>